Uh, yeah, he is joining us. Okay, great. Yeah, and even if we begin, um, I can add him in the middle. As soon as I see him, I can just add him in. Okay, perfect. Great. So we'll wait uh, one more minute, and then I'll introduce you to the to the team. The, the only other thing, just in case you happen to be watching it on the on the uh, attendee app, which which I do, that's how I see the questions. Is there's a 15 second delay? So if you look yeah. over and you see the wrong slide, that's all that's happening. Okay. <laughs> Um, so do you pronounce your last name Ob Obukov? Obukov. Obukov. Mm -hmm. okay, great. Okay, well, let's uh, get started. Um, uh, good morning to those of you in uh, North America and Latin America. Good afternoon to the Europeans and good evening uh, to the Asia people. Um, Welcome to the Puerto Iguazu room for our um, fifth session of this morning. I'm going to hand it over uh, to Timur, Timur Obukov yes. and uh, Luis Bermudez. Mm -hmm. uh, let me add Luis right now. I see him. We're going to be. And good evening uh, to the Asia uh, people. Yeah. Um, welcome to the Puerto Iguazu room for our. Um, Fifth session. Whoever has the session on, please mute. Um, yeah, mute the, the the main session. Sorry about that. Um, uh, and Luis Bermudez, who will talk about uh, the hybrid GIS architecture that the UN Open GIS Initiative is implemented. Take it away, fellas, and uh, we'll wrap up in about twenty minutes and take questions. Um, thank uh, Thank you, Michael. Uh, so my name is Timur Timurobohov. Uh, I'm going to present the uh, our pilot project that we did uh, together with Just Solutions uh, in the United Nations and also with Korean Research Institute for uh, Human Settlements. So a uh, couple of words about uh, the UN. UN uh, United Nations system is very large. As you see, uh, there are not only UN Secretariat, but also various agencies, funds and programs. And all these funds and programs are focusing on various requirements, various needs. So, for example, uh, OHCHR is focusing on, on human rights. Uh, in uh, UNEP, United Nations Environmental Program, is focusing on environment. Um, uh, WFP is focusing on food security. FAO is focusing on agriculture. United Nations Secretary, that's where I work, is actually is focusing on peace and security. That's one of the responsibilities. Uh, we all focus on different issues and needs, but we need access to the same uh, technology and open source technology that's available at the moment. Uh, so access to these platforms can uh, basically um, provide systems, provide knowledge, provide mobile JS applications, various data collection tools, access to data, uh, to open satellite imagery, to baseline data, and so forth. So as you see, it's even though that we're focusing on different issues uh, in the United Nations system, but we need the same thing. We need capacity, we need software, uh, we need data. Uh, and uh, UN Open JS Initiative, that, uh, that's the initiative that was established in 2016. So uh, the, uh, um, provided this opportunity to, to address just special information requirements to the wider UN community. Uh, and also to uh, extend uh, those systems, extend those, um, uh, uh, extend those applications, tools, and software uh, to the academia, to developing countries, and, and so forth. So I can give you a couple of examples. For example, in, uh, in South Sudan and Juba, uh, United, Ma United Nations Mission South Sudan is also providing um, uh, open um, QGIS training to the Juba University. So it's basically we assisting um, uh, local uh, and host countries in developing GIS uh, infrastructure and GIS systems. And also uh, different NGOs and humanitarian communities can also benefit uh, from the development uh, of, uh, of the systems uh, because we are going to share, uh, we are sharing also with them the um, uh, the issue, uh, the, the the software and the systems that we develop. Uh, so the requirements of the United Nations uh, for hybrid JS architecture were basic requirements of uh, of the UN for JS. 
uh, where you enable situational awareness platforms. These are the platforms that assist uh, the decision-making processes. Uh, it will pro it provides the geospatial visualization for improved situation awareness because you can uh, imagine that the situation in the UN and situation in the in in the world and the places where we work is quite various. So we need to uh, collect data, we need to process data, we need to integrate different silos, different systems uh, into one platform that would support uh, decision making processes and situation awareness. Uh, also, JS supports the fulfillment of core mandates, uh, whether it's uh, ceasefire, ceasefire monitoring or monitoring of armed groups or protection of civilians and electoral assistance in, in certain missions. Uh, we also assist in saving lives and support emergency operations, where they identify the uh, locations for search and rescue, uh, uh, crisis management, evacuation, go, no go areas, locations where the minefields are present, where the mines uh, are present, so that uh, we can inform the communities and inform our colleagues um, about the danger in, in those in those locations. Also, JS for the UN enables the cost-effective operations. So um, by using JS, by using satellite imagery and image intelligence uh, and various JS techniques and various JS solutions, uh, we minimize our ground visits uh, at the planning and operational stages and also um, it will provide us best, a better understanding of operational env environment and uh, some specific projects such as groundwater exploration where JS plays an important role. Uh, the situation that we had in the, um, uh, in the uh, UN, uh, so first of all, uh, UN is running, uh, UN is running, um, uh, uh, started developing JS, uh, JS infrastructure in early 2000s. So we are running JS for, uh, for almost two decades. Uh, and uh, we started running JS infrastructure based on the software and based on the solutions that were available at the time. Uh, so at that time, our, uh, the proprietary solutions were available and basically for two decades, we were uh, building our infrastructure on proprietary solution. <clears throat> so, uh, but of course, you know, just it kept us, it kept us away from um, uh, just because of high cost of licenses and uh, high cost of running the system. Uh, it helped, it, it, uh, it prevented us from um, uh, provided limited options for scalability, for mainstreaming, and also different transfer of capacity and technology to the host nations. Uh, for example, uh, before New York, I used to work in East Timor, and when we had to um, uh, deliver, we had to transfer the our JS infrastructure to the host country, we had to also transfer the proprietary software, and quite often the host nations just simply don't have capacity and don't have uh, funds to uh, to run uh, to run the system because it's it's quite expensive. So in this case, uh, what uh, and also the um, uh, in I, I would say from 2014 to 2016 we started looking closely to the uh, open source technology, what open source can provide, and how we can complement the systems that we have uh, with open source. Uh, and of course, uh, that would support uh, operational and technical demands of the United Nations. Um, uh, no licenses, uh, optimizing the cost running of JS infrastructure, uh, flexibility in terms of uh, streamlining, scalability, inter interoperability, innovations, lighter footprint on, on, on IT infrastructure and so forth. It's all great words, um, but um, what we're gonna do with the legacy system? That was, uh, that was the main question. Uh, because uh, the system, our system is, is built on proprietary and some of our clients still demanding uh, some services provided uh, on uh, proprietary solutions. Um, and uh, uh, one of uh, some of our colleagues uh, from WFP, um, Francesco, he uh, proposed the options that they were uh, looking at uh, in, uh, in World Food Program. Uh, to develop a hybrid JS architecture. So it's basically uh, where we have um, integrated geodatabase systems, that uh, geodatabases that would serve both pr proprietary and, uh, and open source solutions. Uh, both of the systems will complement. So for example, the components that are very expensive on, um, on proprietary software can be replaced with open source. 
Uh, it would provide us co co uh, cost effective options. Uh, it will also help us to do uh, to scale to scale up uh, and also to um, to mainstream JS because now JS is becoming one of the systems that everyone requires and um, having uh, issues with uh, licensing and so forth would uh, quite often prevent us uh, from uh, mainstreaming and scaling up the, the solutions, uh, JS solutions. And also it provides social value of, uh, of, of the systems. Uh, we can um, uh, provide uh, JS services to the government, uh, host government and so, and so forth. Uh, in this case, hybrid JS infrastructure will also um, provide the great benefit in building technology independent platforms. Uh, for some of our main uh, platforms that we run in the UN, it's image intelligence uh, applications for uh, analysis uh, of uh, satellite imagery, whether it's SAR technology or optical, uh, for JS solutions such as GeoPortal Unite Aware, GeoStory, Mobile JS, and various geo, uh, data data services that we also have in the UN, uh, such as Unite Maps, uh, Open Drone Maps, Second Level Administrative Boundary, and various geo, geo products for analytics, for thematic mapping, and, and so forth. Uh, we did uh, quite um, non-quantitative uh, impact assessment, impact analysis of running hybrid versus proprietary. As you see, the uh, hybrid here is winning on all stages. It's again, it's not quantifiable. Um, uh, the only thing that um, where, uh, where hybrid would be lacking is legacy uh, and user base. Uh, so just because we are uh, moving to open source technology and or hybrid technology would also um, require to develop you know, user user base capacity of our colleagues, and also just to migrate and transfer the systems and the data from the legacy systems from proprietary systems into uh, open source or hybrid, and also stability because uh, proprietary software uh, quite often uh, comes with this packaged um, uh, package systems uh, where everything is orchestrated, everything is run smoothly. Uh, but with open source technology and with hybrid technology, we always need to integrate various things together and to make sure that they run um, perfectly fine. Um, just to uh, roll out with, uh, with this idea, with our system, so we developed um, uh, the uh, pilot implementation plan, pilot project. Uh, it was for, to, uh, to prove the concept uh, of hybrid JS prototype and support, first of all, for our backend system for Unite Map and also for GeoPortal. Uh, you can see it here, number one and number two. Uh, the duration of the pilot project was six months, but we ran it a little bit uh, longer. Um, and contributors uh, for this pilot project was uh, CRIS, uh, Korean Research Institute for Human Settlements. They provided the funding, uh, UNJS, uh, UN Geo Special, uh, UNJC, Global Support Center in Brindisi and WFP uh, with provision of their um, uh, of their ideas and, and concepts. And also implementation was done by Geo Solutions, but also I would say Geo Solutions were um, contributing partners as well because they invested a lot of time in uh, in this uh, pilot uh, pilot project. So the next step is uh, developing of a global rollout plan for implementing of JS infrastructure. And with this, I'm going to hand over uh, to hand the floor to uh, Luis uh, Bermudez uh, for technical uh, part of this presentation. Thank you. Yeah. Timur, thank you. So good morning, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, should I share my screen or you move the slides, Timur? Uh, I will move the slides, just tell me the next slide. Okay, very good. So I'm presenting here the original technical implementation. So you all get the idea of what a system, a hybrid system would look like. So if you look at the upper left, there is a database and we had to figure out a way to export the data. So it was easily ingested in PostGIS. It was in RSTE, and we decided to use an open standard format like GeoPackage. And uh, we developed a QGIS plugin that reads that your package and other information, which I will show in the next slides. So the data gets ingested into PostGIS. Uh, ideally, we would like to have a staging and a dissemination um, uh, yeah, environments. 
uh, but we only had one environment. But I put these two because it's, it's really important that when we have a system in operation, at least we have these two because we have then a way to state to test in the staging state that everything is okay and then you put it in production. Um, as some of you may know, your uh, node uses on the back U server and PostG. So that's why you see the node U server and then a connection to PostG. So what we did after um, exporting to Geo package and then updating the database, uh, we sync Geo node and U server, meaning that the data was published as layers in your server, and then your node was informed that there was a layer that had to be published in your node. Um, we then tested that uh, clients are able to exercise the data that was available in your node. So that's basically it. We um, also had a task to be able to have a single sign on using Azure, but that is going to be done in the future. Um, okay, next, please. Uh, so as I see this, this as I said, this is the process. Uh, we needed your package, but we also needed the XML workspace definition. Why? Because we really wanted to model as much as possible close to what ArcSD has provided, which is some of the tricky things like domain and types and subtypes. So we were able to, to from that information from the XML workspace definition, um, be able to export the data almost. Um, accurate with all the, let's say, intricacies that are done in, in Esri. Um, next. So we develop, um, as I said, a QGIS plugin, and we developed four main algorithms. One was an XML domain importer, an XML U package, future classes importer, a U server publish, and a U node synchronizer. I'm going to explain a little bit those. So um, for the uh, XML importer, uh, we had to deal with subtypes and domains. For those of you that don't know, uh, this is an example. For example, if you have a, a class or a feature streets, then you can have more detailed streets like local streets and highway streets. And each of these can have their own properties. It can be different or it can be a, a list that uh, only applies to that, let's say, subtype. Um, so, and the way that we deal with this is that we create local partitions. And I'll put a link later. Uh, so, if those of you that are interested, you can check the code and you can check the blog that we wrote about this. But we actually we create a table and then we create lo local partitions. So, we're able to um, store the data very similar to what is stored in ArcSDE. Next. And <clears throat> So the user server publisher um, takes the Esri XML workspace definition, and uh, you have to provide this information. You know what's the model input? Uh, the rest as the geo solutions. Sorry, geo server rest address, uh, because when you invoke the plugin, you are going to talk to geo server to publish uh, that layer. Um, the workspace, data store, etc. Next. And if you are familiar with your node and your server environment, so the way to publish data in GeoNode, if you're using your node, is that you directly use your node to publish the data. But if you have data in your server, there is a way to tell GeoNode that a layer is available for GeoNode, even um, if it is, it, it, so the user server that is behind GeoNode can have layers that are not that, no, that are not known by GeoNode. That can happen. For example, when you install a GeoNode on top of an already existing Geo server. So you need to tell GeoNode uh, that there are some layers that need to be available via GeoNode. And for, with, um, for that, you can invoke the GeoNode REST interface. So we develop also this plugin that provides the information about you know, GeoNode, what is the REST endpoint, the authentication, admin, uh, and the data store and workspace that you want to publish from your server. Next. The other tricky thing was um, exporting styles um, because Esri styles first, they don't use open formats like, um, like SLD. Uh, so they have their own proprietary format. 
and usually you can find these as dot layer or dot layer x and um, we investigated some of the best ways to do it and we found that you know one of the ways is using geocad bridge extension um, that you can invoke directly from arcmap with that we were able to export in sld and then um and then make it available in the server next i'm providing here the link to the qgis code it's called c198 chris because that was the the number of the project we're thinking to make this more you know um a more clean code and and um documented documented it more but uh, at the way as it is, you are, because most of the things that we do is open source, you are welcome to download it, to use it, um, and, uh, you know, in, enjoy uh, the way to to create this hybrid infrastructure, which the one of the parts is trying to see if you can export RKSDE data into PostGIS and GeoNote. Um, next. I think that's it. Yeah. Uh, I just I just want also to add uh, that um, it's basically like normally the any organization they build their geospatial infrastructure either on open source or on proprietary. So and uh, it seems that you know like for us for the UN it was very specific case you know just we had to figure out the way how to uh, build our systems on both that would support because of because of the client base because some of the clients require open source some of the clients require perpetual software and uh we also were grateful to um uh, to geo solutions to luis to chris korean research institute for human settlements for supporting this pilot project uh it's it was very successful and we are looking forward into moving to our next stage which is uh deploying it uh to the uh, to the on the production environment. Thank you, Timur and Luis. That was great. Appreci appreciated it. Very interesting in initiative. Great to see um, open source used in this milieu. It's obviously got um, some clear advantages over you know commercial software and challenges with standards and and cost. Um, uh, we have about four minutes, three or four minutes for questions, and I've got a couple of questions uh, in the in the room that I'll I'll toss over to you. Um, the first question is: Are you working with all UN agencies? I'm working sometimes with the UNHCR, and almost all of their GIS solutions are based on Esri. Uh, yeah, uh, UN Open GIS initiative is open to uh, all UN uh agencies fund, funds and programs to all un uh departments and offices and also to academia to ngos to private sector to everyone so anyone can join in and um uh yes so the answer is yes uh it's most likely you know like UNHCR will need to reach out to us and we'll see what we also can provide to them and what how we can work together so so it's more of a uh, of each group in the UN would want to opt in. It's not like yeah. using this stack is mandated across. Yeah, no, it's not. Stack. It's not mandated. It's uh, voluntarily. If, for example, if UNHCR would like to move to open source, we'll definitely will assist them in this. Awesome. Um, the second question is: Can you speak to participation either by, by UN or member countries in open source projects and community? Thinking of long term sustainability here. So it's a good follow-up question to the previous one, it seems. Uh, sorry, could you please repeat the question? Sure. Uh, can you speak to participation either by UN or member countries in open source projects and community, thinking of long-term sustainability? So uh, if I understand the question, is the UN actively participating in some of the projects, you know, QGIS or uh, GeoServer or whatever the case may be? Uh, yes, uh, we do participate in uh, UN OpenGIS. Uh, through UN OpenGIS, we participate in various um, uh, consortiums, like for example, OSGEO, uh, and also uh, participating in various uh, processes, and also uh, with Geo Solutions, who is uh, developing uh, GeoNo Geo Server. Uh, so that's that's I think that's that's our participation this year. Great. 
And uh, one last question um, seems aimed at uh, Luis, perhaps. Uh, you seem to be using QGIS a lot. Have you considered using QGIS Server? Yeah. Uh, so we are the main developers of QGIS Server, and we know that it's very robust. So we didn't explore other options. Great. Um, well, thank you guys again. Um, you can see uh, both Kimura and Luis have their emails in here. If you have any follow-up uh, or want their slides or anything, please uh, feel free to hit them up. And uh, thanks again for a great session. Um, I'm going to take about five minutes uh, to set up our next and last speaker of this morning.